verse that Ed read sounds like the best possible beginning to an adventure book or a mystery novel. They saw him from a distance, and before he came near, they conspired to kill him. I mean, if you heard that as the Netflix intro to a new short series, wouldn't you binge it? It sounds like there's this great story behind it. There's so much mystery that's built up in that one line. You don't even have to have read what comes before to think, oh, this is going to get good. And it does. We've tried to consolidate a few readings today to give us snippets across Joseph's life as we kind of continue our chronological walk through the scriptures, looking at the stories in the order and they unfold and how one influences the other. And today we get this really great story of Joseph and the brothers. Jacob, Joseph's dad, had two wives and he loved one of them. Remember, when we use that expression, biblical family values, there's a lot to be careful of there. Jacob had 12 sons, but he loved the ones from her the most. The oldest child from the wife he loved was Joseph, and Joseph was by far the favorite, clearly the favorite child. Not the best parenting, but clearly a favorite child. Besides the fact that there is the honor of our mothers at stake between these brothers that creates some tension, there's also Joseph's pouring of affection and even gifts onto Joseph. If people don't know anything else about Joseph, they know that he had a technicolor dream coat. Thank you, Andrew Lloyd Webber and Tim Rice. Joseph, as a character, becomes the lead in this story. He's the lead in the musical, and whether it's Michael Damien or whether it is Donny Osmond that comes to mind, regardless of whose abs you see in your mind when you think of Joseph and the coat, he really at the core early on in the story is a little brat. We'll go with brat. That's the polite church word for it. But you can enter any other expression of frustration you want there, and I'm sure the brothers did. No doubt Joseph was gifted. He dreams of the future, and it tends to happen. He can interpret the dreams of others, and he's pretty accurate. He also liked telling people what his dreams were and what they meant. When you have, though, a dream about your siblings and your parents bowing down to you, there's some things you keep to yourself, you little brat. Social skills, not on the list of Joseph's gifts as a child. But one day, Joseph is walking out to meet his brothers. They see him coming, and before he even gets there, they were done. You got to imagine the conversations. Oh, great, here he comes. What's he going to brag about today? Oh, wonderful. What passive-aggressive put-down is he going to throw our direction in this encounter? They've decided violence is the best solution. They've discussed it. He's old enough. He's had time to learn. Nothing's changed. Time for violence among brothers to see if we can settle this. But then come along some merchants, some Ishmaelites. Remember those from the story last week? Isaac and Ishmael, the two covenants. So extended, extended family. All these stories circle back in on each other. A very small parcel of land. All these stories are taking place on. So this group of merchants, these Ishmaelites come along, and the brothers decide that violence sounds good, but today capitalism will do. It's a fair exchange. So instead of killing Joseph, they kill a goat. They sell him to the Ishmaelites as a slave. Again, good biblical family values. How do we treat our family? Eh, see what they're worth. Then we'll decide. They sell him off, but they keep his coat. They tear it to shreds, which had to feel so good, right? Like just in this little bit, we can get enough 
empathy with these brothers to think that tearing that coat had to be such a cathartic thing for them. They dip it in the goat's blood, and then they take it back and explain to their dad that his prized child was killed by a petting zoo reject. That had to feel good, too, until they saw their dad fall apart. But we don't get much of that story. It follows Joseph. The scriptures follow Joseph, and this is where his story really soars. He gets sold to an Egyptian nobleman named Potiphar. Joseph's a good worker, clearly very smart, and before you know it, Potiphar keeps promoting him until he's in charge of the house. He's paying everyone else. He's organizing. He's running everything as head butler, steward, economist, and financial in manager. He's doing it all. He's doing everything that Potiphar would normally have to do at home, which is where Potiphar's wife comes in, and she decides that she is also part of Joseph's responsibility. And as she explains that her pleasure and her enjoyment in life is now something he should be contributing to, Joseph resists and says, no, that's not my job. That's a boundary I won't cross. To which she cries foul, tells Potiphar that Joseph has come on to her, and Joseph then goes from slave to head of a house to in prison. But even in prison, he gets along with people. He's nice. He's a servant. He's smart. He's helpful. He helps the jailers out. They put him in charge of other prisoners. And along the way, he goes back to hearing and sharing dreams. He tells those who come what their dreams mean. Again, maybe with a lack of tact sometimes. Oh, I wouldn't want a dream like yours. You're going to be killed. Okay, you could have eased into that, Joseph. Or, I like your dream. Pharaoh's going to forgive you, and you'll go back to being Pharaoh's butler again. Luckily, that butler remembers Joseph, because Pharaoh is having dreams that none of Pharaoh's court and advisors can interpret. I don't know why. When I read this story as a teenager, I could clearly interpret it. I should have been in Pharaoh's court. Everyone else I've met, whoever hears these dreams goes, duh, we should all have been in charge of Pharaoh's court. How did they build the pyramids if they couldn't figure this out? But anyway, they need Joseph out of prison to interpret Pharaoh's dreams. So the butler becomes the job hunter and brings Joseph into all this. Joseph comes, he interprets Pharaoh's dreams as a forecast for the weather and for their farming. Clearly, there's going to be a large drought follow that will come after great gain. So lots of rain and lots of crops and then drought. Better get ready for it. And Joseph puts a little bug in Pharaoh's ear and you might want to find somebody who could help figure out how to navigate all this while standing there like this. Again, he's never subtle. Pharaoh says, you know, you're right. And I agree. You're in charge of rationing. Start collecting, start storing, do what we have to do to get through this crisis. And as Joseph leads them, it's clear that he knows what he's doing. It's clear that he's gifted. Everything he touches seems to be blessed. And so Pharaoh makes him number two in charge of all of Egypt. But the brother's story comes back full circle now. Because droughts don't tend to just hit one town or one place. They hit large regions. And the Ishmaelites didn't take Joseph too far before they sold him. So the drought's affecting the brothers and Jacob's whole family too. The brothers come to Egypt seeking food and supplies to help them get through the drought. Joseph recognizes them, knows who they are, and is curious if things have changed. The drought comes along with Joseph's doubts about who these brothers might have become. There is a lengthy period of testing in the story on Joseph's part. They don't recognize him at all. Why would they? He's in full Egyptian garb. He's a much different person. He's much older when they left him. And plus, he's a slave somewhere in a hole, not, you know, in charge of Egypt. There's probably a distance between him and them. But how Joseph, who never seemed to do things subtly, kept a straight face, I do not know. These brothers who might have killed him had things gone different. These brothers who definitely sold him seem to be different now. Along in the testing, they stand up for one another, including Joseph's younger brother from the same mother. These men now speak with honesty 
They follow up their words and they stand by them. So Joseph reveals himself and asks them to bring Jacob back to Egypt to live with them. Through this saga, there's some truths that we can't ignore. Even though it seems to end well at this point, there's some truths that we see that unfold along the way. People are capable of unimaginable harm. And people are capable of growing and changing. And those apply to the same people. In our world where we like to divide people out, where we like to know who the good ones are and who the bad ones are to protect our own feelings, this story reminds us that we are all capable of unimaginable harm. And we are all capable of growing and changing. Even Joseph, who is the the star of our story, causes incredible harm in his family. Now, the way he treats others, the way he belittles them, the way he speaks down to them, treats those who are older than them as if he is better than them. He causes harm along the way in his relationships. But he also grows and changes, as do the other characters in the story. This is one of the most beloved stories in the Hebrew scriptures, not because the music to it is snappy, but because it shows the most growth in character. You've got Joseph, you get Moses, you get Elijah. And along the way, you see all three change and grow some, especially Joseph and Moses, which is why I think Joseph captures our imagination. It is easier if we divide people. It's easier if we label people. It's easier if we judge people as this or that so we know what to expect. It's easier to let our assumptions guard our hearts so we don't get hurt. But Joseph challenges us to see the gray area, to dwell in the complexity. Because we know that when we guarantee love to everyone, we guarantee love for ourselves. We also know that when we divide, we assure ourselves we will be living in division. If you want to know how to make sure you are lonely and feeling like the world's against you, judge everybody in advance and keep them at a distance. Yet that is what we so often do to preserve our hearts so that we don't get hurt. There is a great line in the new Thor movie, and I won't give anything away, and I'll edit it just a bit for a couple of you who know where I'm going. At the beginning, he's talking about how he feels nothing. And his good friend, Peter Quill, says, actually, I feel really crappy. I lost the one I loved. I know how you feel. But when I feel this way, I look into the eyes of those I love, and I know who I am. Later in the movie, Thor tells the woman he loves, I want to feel crappy with you. She wasn't there for the conversation, so she doesn't get it at first. But he decides he would rather feel the pain and the sting of love and relationship than harden his heart to the world around him. That a lot of his lack of meaning comes from the lack of relationship. And Joseph reminds us that those we love will hurt us. It will happen. That's what happens when we let people close, because we are all capable of causing harm, whether it's great or just normal family stuff, normal relational stuff. We will step on each other's toes and hearts. But that's so much better than feeling like we're alone, even in a crowd. We guarantee that we will live without love when we begin with division. Joseph and his brothers lay out a story of trauma and hurt. We see a divided family full of hurts. We see a destructive power of competition and privilege. We see the capacity for harm and healing that all of them hold and at some degree use or refuse. We see that good and bad both come regardless of our level of faithfulness. And then at the end, God is there at every stage of the process. The story of Joseph plays a transition in the biblical story. In the biblical story, it moves into Egypt. It takes God's people on a similar journey to Joseph, 
a slave in Egypt. They come to Egypt with Joseph, they populate there, and they become slaves there that Moses will later free. Come back next week for the rest of the story. But they also become 12 brothers into 12 tribes. This is where the story evolves from the descendants of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob into 12 tribal people with shared customs and beliefs, trying to stay together, trying to see what connects them, how they have a similar experience of God and what it means to be identified as a culture and a people. This story is the bridge between those two sections of the story. Yet at its core as a story, just on the story itself, Joseph reminds us that we all possess great potential for hurting others and great potential for serving others. It reminds us that we all possess a great deal of potential for inspiring anger or creating change. With our humanity comes power. With our humanity comes power. The power doesn't come from divesting ourselves from our humanity. It doesn't come from walling ourselves off. It doesn't come from dehumanizing others so that we can rise above them. Our power comes in our humanity. That power can cause us, though, often to lose our humanity. We see it time and time again. But this, this comes up throughout all of our scriptural stories so far. We started with Genesis 1 and 2 a few weeks ago, where we were given power, dominion, responsibility over creation. And then we got the flood story, where we are given the power to rescue, to save, to protect. And then the story of God's covenant, where we are reminded that the power we gain is even amplified in community, in communities of covenant when we care for one another instead of oppressing one another, when we respect the covenants and relationship others have with God instead of being scared and divided by them. And then today we are reminded by Joseph that our humanity grants us power. We can use it to abuse others or we can use it to protect the humanity of all God's people. We can use the power of humanity, shared humanity, seeing the good in others to reconcile what has been broken. Joseph reminds us that our humanity grants us power. We can lose our humanity when we fail to see it in others, or we can reclaim the humanity of ourselves and our community when we face our brokenness and we grow. When we face our brokenness and grow. I don't know how Joseph's internal monologue went, but I really believe that the musical may have done some justice to Joseph's reflection. There's a great song, Close Every Door to Me, that imagines him in prison, lamenting his place, and in the end saying, but in the end, God, you are my God, and I'm just one person. Humility helps Joseph reclaim his humanity. For different ones of us, it is different things. Things we have used to keep others at a distance or prop ourselves up. Sometimes it's ego, sometimes it's self-deprivation. Sometimes we attack ourselves early, beat ourselves down so nobody else gets a chance. Till we lose our humanity and in judging others, we fail to see theirs as well. They become the monsters in our lives. For others of us, we prop ourselves so far above others or distance ourselves so far from them, we can't possibly still see the good in them. Remember back in Lent when we went through our stages of restorative justice and we talked about relationship, continuing to be in relationship, respect, being close enough in relationship to see the potential in others again. Responsibility, naming what's ours in that, looking at where we see all of our problems together, not just blaming and pointing. And then repair, finding the ways we can do better. Joseph's story is about repair. In some ways, Joseph is a character transcends gender, identity, and expression in his story. He is a symbol for the every person. 
Joseph has love and hurt. They feel insecurity and inadequacy. They also feel superiority, the complexity of who we are. They understand betrayal and success. They experience forgiveness and reconciliation. They hold the full scope of human emotion in their heart. And such an experience is baked into the DNA of all of us, into us all. The ability to succeed and face failure. The ability to love and seek love again when it evades us. The ability to hurt and to heal is right here in Joseph's story. We have the ability to see the same humanity in all God's people. We have the ability to see that same humanity, including in ourself. May our eyes be always open. May our hearts be always open to the dreamers, to the schemers, and all of us in between. May we be open to the full human experience. May God help us hold on to our humanity while we seek it and see it in one another. Amen.